Good evening, everyone. My name is Uday Bhaskar, and we normally, as I said, do have a tradition that we cast off on time. So it's just a minute after 7 p.m., so it's appropriate. So I'll just take a couple of minutes, if I may, to first of all welcome all of you. You can see I'm fumbling for my specs. I'm not sure where I've left them, but I will find them yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, as I said, my name is Uday Bhaskar, and first of all, can I request all of you to put your phones on silent or discreet, as the case may be. As most of you, I can see some of our regular invitees and participants. This is part of the Changing Asia lecture series that we organize, the Habitat and the Society for Policy Studies. So we've done a range of subjects. And it was appropriate that we should be looking at something that's also in the arts and culture. So that is the choice that we have made for today, where we have creative industries smart for the world ahead. But I won't go beyond that except to welcome and introduce uh, the speaker, which will be done by the director of the Habitat, Mr. Sunit Tandon. I'll take a minute to introduce Mr. Tandon. Some of you have already met him, for those who haven't. Mr. Sunit Tandon is the director of the India Habitat Center, and earlier he'd served as the DG, the Director General of the IIMC, that's the Indian Institute of Mass Communication. On that note, I'm also very glad to see some of our younger invitees here from the Global Youth Team. Uh, I'll come back to you all in a minute. Mr. Tandon was also the Chief Executive of the Lok Sabha Television. And he's also been, as those of you who may be aware and may have seen him, he was a news and current affairs TV anchor for a long time, radio broadcaster, a music critic. He's been active as a theater director and actor with approximately 200 productions to his credit. Anybody who knows anything about the theater world, 200 productions is, you know, an achievement, if I may say so. On that note, what I'll do is to request Mr. Tandon to chair the proceedings for this evening and just leave the last sort of, uh, shall I say, request come suggestion for our younger members from Global Youth. 500 words by 12 noon tomorrow about this, right? <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, it's all yours. <laughs> going to introduce our speaker. And... Good evening. Thank you very much indeed, Kamude Udair Bhaskar, who is a very old friend. Actually, I first encountered Kamude Bhaskar, Udair Bhaskar because of television. Uh, I think I used to interview him quite a lot in the old days as an anchor. He was an expert on strategic affairs. But Shonjoy I met for the first time through theater. In fact, he was uh, two or three years junior to me in college, and he came in as a fresher, and he immediately made a mark on the theatrical scene in college. And within his first year, I think he was acting with Barry John in Tag Productions. I remember he played the role of Venticello, one of the Venticelli in Amadeus. So I have uh, very clear, distinct memories of Sean Joy 40 years ago as a very young actor, but very bright, very energetic. And it's been a delightful journey watching Sean Joy over the years with all that brightness and energy carve out a niche for himself which has been completely unique. He has been truly a path breaker in terms of the arts. Not only is he an accomplished performer and director, but he has also decided to carry the whole arts movement forward to find new opportunities for people, to find new connections. And uh, in setting up teamwork arts, I think he has done a signal service to the country, to the arts in particular, and has become such an impassioned advocate for all the arts that he is now known worldwide. I think his impact is felt in at least 40 countries. Uh, and this is what I understand from the websites. Um, and uh, he has, of course, we all know him as one of the moving forces behind the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. But quite apart from that, he's also a moving force behind, and a force for good, behind the Salam Balak Trust, which has, uh, which works for street children and has been working for a number of years consistently and doing excellent work. 
Um, I, it would take too long to go through the list of the many festivals and initiatives that Sanjoy has taken over the years. But truly speaking, he's become a cultural ambassador for India to the rest of the world and of the rest of the world to India. I don't think we can say better than that. Sanjoy, thank you very much for agreeing to come here and to speak on a subject which is really intensely important. And I'm a little disappointed to see that there's not enough interest perhaps because of the nature of the general audience of the SPS series, lecture series, they think that this perhaps is not in their orbit. But truly speaking, creative industries today account for a very large part of the GDP of the world, much larger than you can assume, and contribute hugely to employment across the globe. And quite apart from that, there is increasing uh, uh, understanding, appreciation of the fact that creative industries are, constitute smart power and uh, have tremendous role to play in strategic affairs even. So I'm hoping to hear many enlightening things from Chonjo, who has more experience than anybody present here or anybody that I know of dealing with the creative industries across the world. I might also inform you that he's also vice chair of the FIKI uh, committee on uh, co-chair yeah. co of the creative industries. creative industries. So he's playing a role not only in promoting artists, but also promoting the cause of the arts as a contributor to our economy. Uh, Shonjoy, I'll request you to speak. And then uh, after you've spoken for whatever length of time you decide, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour, and then we will have a series of questions and answers. Thank you so much, Sunit. Thank you, uh, Kamar Bhaskar, for doing this. Uh, Uday was very much part of uh, our lives in the sense of my father, and he uh, did a lot of policy advocacy for um, the services and India's military power. And um, I find it uh, really quite intriguing that I'm having the opportunity of addressing your institution in this in this particular uh, manner and assuming that the minute you said arts, everybody ran for cover because they felt that it wasn't quite up their street. Um, one of you should wave to me at around 25 minutes so I know that, you know, because there are not so many people, I'm assuming you're now absolutely frozen to your chair and you can't escape, so that's a wonderful thing, so, but please wave. It'll be one of the rare occasions that Vidyun actually has to sit through something for more than a period of time. <laughs> so I, I really just wanted to start by um, mourning the loss. I don't know if all of you have noticed, but I, I, perhaps you've seen the news that uh, last night in Brazil, uh, their national museum went up in flames with over 200,000 objects. And I remember 50 years ago, a little bit, little bit more than that, when the Canadian library, their national library, went up in flames in Ottawa. Um, I remember meeting the director of the library uh, some uh, sometime uh, 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 recent, maybe, maybe a decade ago, and he and I were talking about what is the importance of knowledge and memory and history, and what happens when some tragedy like this is inflicted, whether it's the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, in Afghanistan, which are destroyed willfully, or whether objects of art and history and collective memory perish in this fire that happened last night. And this is really what I want us to start uh, reflecting on in the beginning as to why is it important. Why is history important? Why is it important to be reflective of and preserve this kind of built architecture, heritage, creativity, our past? At the same time, while this was burning, perhaps some of you may have seen uh, the discovery on the banks of the Nile, which was announced yesterday by the archaeological uh, this thing of Egypt, where they discovered new settlements which predates the pharaonic times. So that's uh, now, um, there's been dated for I think 5000 BCE. And 
both of these happen roughly at the same time, and I think you know this is time for us to then look at why is it important to discover, restore, look at, preserve, consider history. Primarily because everything that we stand for today and everything that we sit in this room, including the fact that there's nothing Indian in this particular room, comes from the fact of our collective evolution over a particular period of time. And it's reflective of a collective passing off of knowledge uh, generation through generation, as we've done with our own great scriptures, whether it's the Mahabharat or the Ramayana, and of course, both are or the Krishna leader. Bo all three of them are now being looked at as historical fact as opposed to mythology. And therein lies uh, the conundrum of when does history uh, become, or when does mythology become history, become fact, and how do we deal with it? So that's, again, just to place into perspective what we have to grapple with today. As I said to uh, Commodore and, and Sunit, uh, we all understand that the importance of art is, is somewhat restricted, especially in today's world. Uh, people don't look at it as, as important, as is reflective in today's room. But I, what, what I did want to uh, uh, present to you is the fact that in India, if you look at just India alone, the submission is that about 400 million people of, in India today either get their primary or their secondary income from the arts, from the creative industries. Everything from the raga, ragi and the gurdwara, to the pandal maker, to the guy who's been making the Ganesh statues or the, or the Durga statues, to the weavers, uh, to uh, rural and semi-urban populations who between uh, the agricultural uh, seasons are involved in some kind of additional creative activity which they use to be able to earn and uh, 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 create some kind of economy which is local uh, to their particular place. And this is important for us to understand. 70, 71 years after independence, there is not one ministry in the government of India which has any basic facts whatsoever which will tell you how many people are involved in this industry. Sunit, in his introduction, talked about you know, the creative industries or the cultural industries. Uh, the reckoning is that in the UK today, uh, the creative industries is the second largest contributor to UK's economy after banking. So it, today, it contributes about 17.5% to 18% of UK's GDP, so just the creative uh, industry. Similarly, in France, it's again number two after its defense industries. In Germany, it's number three. But we have no idea what it is in India because we have no basis of understanding or finding what the details are. The good news is that uh, two years ago, the, the, the uh, Ministry of Culture, which tends to be much more moribund than it being active, has put into place a committee uh, which is now looking at culturally mapping the entire country village by village. And hopefully some of the information uh, will be used for productive purposes and we will have access to this information and we'll be able to understand uh, what the contribution thereof is. Those of you in the room who may be involved in some way in the arts or outside of it, you have to understand that today when we are talking about creating jobs and creating, um, uh, 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 generating uh, uh, local economies of scale and so on and so forth, where is it happening? It's happening through the creative industries. The one country in Asia that's understood that and primarily coming into India again and again and again to take this uh, from us are the Chinese. The Chinese discovered the length and breadth and the diversity of India some years ago in the 2000, 2001, 2002, when they saw India's smart power, and I'll use the word smart power as opposed to soft power, so smart in the same way that we use our defense purposes, uh, industries. They, they saw how India boxed above its weight in the Edinburgh festivals in that period. They went with a checkbook to the festival director and the Edinburgh to two people and said, how much money do you need 
so that we are the we are the focus country next year and why is india here first before us similarly in 1995 singapore while it was trying to reconstruct its whole uh, um, image realized that the one thing that would take them into the next uh, millennium would be the creative industries so it invested 1.2 billion dollars singapore dollars into creating infrastructure in singapore to be able to uh, become an international city and a city where creativity could thrive and i remember you know by which time we had the safed chap just for a clarification he said 40 years ago i'm 32 so i don't know how far back his memory goes to but um, yeah so <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, when you look, I mean, we had, you know, we had received us a fit chap plus I had the long hair, so everybody thinks, and I can speak in a particular way. So I tick all the boxes, you know, diversity, tick, tick, and Sushma will tell you how that happened, and you know, creativity and long hair and speaks English. So I ticked all the boxes. So I used to sit on some of these, you know, Arts Council of England and blah and blue and so on and so forth. So we had a Safed chap, and because of the Safed chap. Singapore invited us to set up shop in 2001 in, in, in that city. And I remember when the minister inaugurated our, our office and the first festival, etc. he said to me, so Sanjoy, what would you have achieved in 10 years? Would all our citizens you know, be playing the piano or will all our citizens be playing you know, the violin? And I said, well, you know, minister, some people will play the violin and some people may play the the piano and some people will kick a football and some people may not do any of the above and he wasn't happy with the answer because in singapore's development style when they had a focus then everybody had to do that every citizen and we had to explain to them if their primary purpose was to look into the millennium and look at the thriving future of their world then it had to be creativity and creativity could only come if they lifted the lid of the, of the pressure cooker, which is lifted the lid from dissent and all of the other things that go with creativity. And when we set up our first festival there, which was a festival of first films, our primary uh, uh, requirement and therefore their agreement was that there would be no censorship, which was unheard of in Singapore, absolutely unheard of. And in those first years, because we were trying to you know, set a precedent, we sort of pushed the anvil and had films on bestiality and LGBTQ and drugs and, and everything that was anathema to Singapore and its government at that point of time. Of course, five years later, we faced the consequences because everybody else then complained as to how did this organization, which is not even, you know, I mean, I'm not Singaporean, how did they get, um, uh, 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 the, the possibility of not having censorship and so on and so forth. But today, the same people thank us for what we were able to do for them. Because in lifting that lid, they were able to get their young people to start thinking and more importantly, telling their own stories. And if you tell your own stories, which is not derivative of a different culture, but is reflective of your own culture, that's the first step to creating an incredible knowledge base. We have to remember that as the third industrial revolution dies behind us, and especially countries like India will never be able to compete, perhaps as a manufacturing base with people like Vietnam or, or, or China, etc. What is our future? The future is the knowledge enterprise. That is where we can excel. We can create jobs, we can drive local economies, we can contribute to local GDP, and yet we seem to be blissfully aware, unaware of the fact that this is even a possibility. No skilling council, no uh, 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 prime minister's uh, department even looks at this seriously. One is, of course, you know, the, 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 one of the problems is that if I, maybe if I cut my hair and stop speaking out loud, Maybe I would not be seen as a contrarian, but unfortunately, that is my business. The arts does represent the country point of view, and you have no choice but to create platforms where all points of view exist in the same time, and allows people to understand that 
all points of view are valid. There's no one truth. Like the telling of Rashomon, six or seven different people had six or seven different points of view. Was one correct or the only truth? No, it isn't. It wasn't. Look at the retelling of the Mahabharat. You can tell the Mahabharat from a million angles, as has been done over the last 5,000 years and continues to be done. There's a book on the Mahabharat every day being published somewhere in the world with a new angle or a new story. Why? Is it different from what that story was? No. It's an interpretation. It's a retelling. It's an understanding. It's looking at a character from a different point of view. And that, in its entirety, is what makes India what it is. We are an incredibly diverse country. Every 100 kilometers, we know that everything changes. The way we look, what we dress, the way we talk, our, even our ceremonies, our food, everything. And yet, we hang together in this particular way. Why? Because we've always been plural. And that is what China is trying to understand. Every month, there's a vice chair or vice chairperson, etc., who comes from one of their ministries to be able to understand how India has been able to hang together, allow a plurality of voices, allow a plurality of religion, at least till recently, and allow people to be able to voice his or her opinion, celebrate his or her art from cradle to grave without imposing as they've done in Tibet. They have understood is that if they need to integrate one, uh, the Sichuan province with the Ugya province with any of the other provinces, each province must be allowed to flourish, must be proud of its inherent culture, must discover its roots, must be able to tell its stories, must be able to find its literature, be able to find its heritage, be able to celebrate its culture. And yet, there is a tendency today, and I, I hope that that tendency will be defeated in India to try and create a monochromatic view of what Bharat or Akhand Bharat or, uh, uh, or India is. It can't succeed. And, it, and for all of us who believe in the very principles of democracy, which were not necessarily an inherent uh, principle that created India. For each of us, we must fight for that. Because in fighting for that, you're fighting for plurality of expression and form and so on and so forth. Look at, if you look around today and you look around the fact that just in the craft, space of craft and, 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 de and, and design, etc., our uh, cultural economy is so vibrant. And yet, when you look around rooms like this, you see it missing, barring the color on this particular chair. There's not one element in this room that will tell you that you are in India, you're in Delhi, you are part of a heritage which celebrates this kind of diversity. And therein again lies a problem, because when you're being derivative of a different culture, because we all look to the West much, mostly from the 60s through to the 2000s, we were looking at the West for inspiration because they were leading the cultural revolution in many ways while we weren't. But today we must rediscover that particular sense of diversity that we have. We must have a design intervention in it. And with that design intervention, marry knowledge. And the minute you're able to do all three, you will see an enormous difference in the way we view our heritage, the way we view our cities, the way we view traditional knowledges. What is the one building in India or Delhi that's been built which post-independence that reflects this outside of the lotus uh, uh, temple? Very few public buildings have come up to reflect that particular sense of heritage, where you're able to introduce the varied sense of what India is from Kerala to JNK, from Bengal to Maharashtra. And we must rediscover that in order to be able to be that unique selling point. As the, as the world barrels on and as the economies of the world 
continue to come together at the same time as diverge and come together because of the World Wide Web, because of the democratization of communication. But at the same time, if you look at every city state today, across America, through all the way to Australia, you'll see everybody worried and building their walls to sort of shut out the other. The minute you start shutting out the other and the trade wars that we are seeing has ensued over the last few months, you will see immediately the after effect or the side effect or the fallout of that on economies, especially like that of India, which we are seeing. Look at your gas price today. It is the highest that it's ever been. Look at the rupee. It's the lowest that it's ever been. It, and, and for those naysayers who say it's Modi's fault, it's not. It's not necessarily about A government or B government. It's about the way the world is structured today. You've got America telling you, stop business with Iran. Uh, you've got America telling you, you can't work with Russia. You've got America dictating what it believes is good for itself, not realizing that it cannot be good for itself because it's time is the very business of interdependence, which is today a factor, not just a factor, a reality. And in that interdependence, as everything becomes same, like this room, what do we need to do to sell ourselves, to sell our wares? I wear my hair long, perhaps that's one instance. But with India, you have so much that you can say that this is India's unique uh, selling point. And it is, and we see that whenever we go, why, I mean, today we do uh, whatever, 40 odd festivals and, uh, ex sorry, 26 odd festivals and 40 odd cities and uh, 16 odd countries or something like that. In every country that we go to, we see the hunger of being able to understand India. Uh, 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 some, some years ago, just before Richard, uh, when Richard Varma was here, I remember one day he, he called and he said, you know, Sanjay, I have this uh, uh, group of industrialists coming. Will you, will you come and have a chat with them? Because they're really stressed. So I said, what happened? He said, you know, I think you need to give them a cultural context of India. So anyway, I went for a drink, and there was this sundry group of uh, industrialists from mostly middle America. And they had their woes about how they come to India. They shake hands. They have an MOU. They have an understanding. They go away, and nothing happens. Or if something happens, they certainly in many making any money out of it. So I said, you know, American cultures that you fly into a country, you sign a deal, you negotiate it, you shake hands, and you fly out, assuming that everything is in process. So I said, so what have you understood about India's culture? I said, if you're going to do business in India, you first have to come, say hello, go back, then come for your partners, to be partners, birthday party perhaps, or grandson's first examination or uh, whatever, bring a little gift, go back, then come for the 75th birthday of the mother or the grandmother or whoever it is, bring a gift, understand, go for the wedding. And after understanding who you're planning to jump into bed with, then sign the deal. Because if you think you're going to get one penny out of an Indian businessman, you know, think again. You know, forget the Jews back home in New York. We are double that. It's about cultural understanding. If you do not understand the culture of a country or a space or its people, how will you do anything from business or otherwise? China, for example, some years ago, after 65 years, uh, Shanghai um, agreed to have a focus on India. 65 years later, because the Politburo finally gave them a thing. Uh, this is, and every successive consul general for the last 10 years had been telling me, we have to do this. I said, we have to do that. They have to agree. So anyway. We go in there and all my colleagues from the British Council in the UK to the Canadians to the Americans said, this particular department in the city of Shanghai is the worst in the country. So negotiate and count your fingers every time you shake hands. I said, okay. We negotiated for, for three or four or five months, etc. August 20th, we signed an MOU. Um, 
August 26th, they called our Consul General and said, you know, there's some spelling mistakes, etc. Can you get Mr. Roy to re-sign some of the pages? I asked them, I said, have you read it? They said, yes, we've read it because all in Chinese. So I signed it and we went, I flew in on the 7th of September for a, for a meeting. And my colleague and I, and you know, every time I said something, the Chinese counterpart said, oh, but this is not in the contract. After a while, I said, am I hallucinating? I could be. Sometimes I do. Uh, you know, have I not understood what they're saying? So I said, pull down the earlier contract. And we started matching it. And what we realized is what they'd done is because, you know, only the Chinese is what sits in the court of law in China. So the English remained the same. The Chinese had changed. But some of these key areas had changed. I was furious. And, you know, the, well, the Chinese culture is that when you start getting angry, they take you for lunch or dinner, and they all sit around, and they start pouring uh, drinks into your, into your mug, and they start toasting you. They don't drink, but all they do is to get you to drink, because they expect that that's something that's going to soften you up. In doing so, all it did to me was get me super irritated and angry. So by the end of it, I told my colleague, I said, I'm not having them pay for our bill. You go and pay for the bill. I stood up, and I said, you know, I know all of you understand English. There's a word in the dictionary called slime. You guys are really slimy. None of this is acceptable to me. And I walked out. Loss of face, as we know in China, is one of the biggest cultural problems. It was a disaster, meaning all hell broke loose. Everybody went hysterical. But I did that knowing one thing that three or four weeks later, when we were going to open, every last ticket had already been sold out across the country for this particular um, uh, a showcase, which was many shows and so on and so forth. So I called Ashok Kanta, who was our, our then ambassador in, in Beijing on a Friday, and I said, Ashok, the, send them an email at 5.30 Friday evening saying I'm not taking the flight. So he said, are you sure? I said, yeah. And I said, when they call, tell your secretary to say that you're not available. And on Saturday, call them back and say, the Consul General in Shanghai will meet with them at 8.30 PM on Sunday. And he said, but in China, you can't do that. I said, exactly. Understand the culture, work at it. Because what we realized, or what I understood, is that if you're able to stand up to a bully, as we do a lot of the times, they immediately understand and start treating you as an equal. So finally, when I did, I mean, they agreed to everything because 8.30 on Sunday, you know, huge issue, et cetera. Everything had been sold out. They couldn't cancel anything. And I'd said to them, I will not appear in any formal official photograph. Everybody else could. When I landed, they took me out for lunch and said, we didn't realize you were so powerful. And I'm going, you know, what does that mean, you know, in this particular space? But again, the reason I give you this is really to illustrate how important understanding of culture is. And in our not addressing it, we forget that that, in fact, is the bedrock of everything that we do and everything that we negotiate on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a big, big problem. Arts and development as you know, is the other huge area of work. And I was at the Scottish Parliament uh, last weekend. We, every two years, we do something called the Culture Minister Summit, where ministers fr from uh, across, uh, across the world come together in Scottish Parliament during the Edinburgh Festival, primarily to be able to understand the arts and its value. And m many of the ministers basically you know, read out their bureaucrats' written um, uh, uh, verbiage. And then they go home, and they've had their holiday, and they get their TADA, and it makes no difference to anybody and their children. So this being the third or the fourth uh, summit that happened, one of the things that we said was that I said, don't let the minister speak up front. Let every minister react. Uh, post the plenary and the workshop session. So the, it was structured as plenary. Four or five people talked about a particular issue, followed by workshop breakaway groups. Then the ministers came back and did their presentations based on what they heard or what they saw. And then one of the most important things that we said was that let's look at not just, you know, arts is wonderful, arts is beautiful, arts is creates all of this intangible nonsense kind of stuff. I said, let's look at how we can demonstrate that the arts makes a difference. So there was um, 
there were sessions on infrastructure and development, investment, contribution to the GDP, local economies. And one of the most amazing uh, sessions was arts and well-being. And I'm going to share with you these four uh, case studies uh, borrowing from the professors who who presented it. So one was on how music, uh, Sunit, and you will understand that what um, Uday forgot to say that apart from everything he hosts or did host one of the best jazz shows ever uh, for at least two decades or three decades or something, which is a great loss that we don't have that anymore. But you will understand the music thing. So this particular uh, professor, Professor Habibi from the University of California, she did a study, which uh, a control study, an experimental study, and they mapped the brain at various uh, points of time, where they used music uh, to look at how music could arrest Alzheimer's. And as you know, because Alzheimer's is such a progressive uh, disease and um, there's not enough research on understanding of yet how to how to be able to arrest it apart from some particular drugs. This was absolutely a phenomenal study. And what it showed in the brain mapping, in, and this the research was done in a two, uh, three, and a five-year uh, period. It showed that in performing particular kinds of music, what happened in the brain was that the brain created new channels. So the old channels which had dried up and therefore had led to Alzheimer's, which weren't lubricated anymore, the brain started creating left to right new channels. And one of the experiments that Professor Huib from Norway, um, uh, you know, the, his, his, his work is absolutely spectacular. So he, he, uh, he took this um, a very famous eminent violinist from the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, who had stopped performing because they showed his progression of Alzheimer's. So you know, in Alzheimer's, you f you first look at this, and then after a while, you'd see, you know, the movement sort of slowing down and becoming erratic. And so he studied the way this particular violinist played. So for the first five minutes, he played perfectly, you know, that particular Beethoven thing. And then the performance sort of slid off, and then it completely uh, became erratic and whatever. And at the end of this, this particular presentation he did, he had the violinist perform in parliament for all of us to show what a difference from what we saw as the research paper had done for him two years later. It was amazing. Everybody gave him a standing ovation. And it was a new uh, uh, discovery. Uh, it's published, you know, reported by the peers, accepted as new therapy. Uh, the, 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 was that the first one I gave as an example? The first. The second one was um, uh, where uh, um, they looked at dance and Parkinson's. So as you know, with Parkinson's, you freeze. You know, you can't move. You can't leave the room. But that same person who freezes, if you put music on, that person can dance his way in a way that's not, you know, in one line out of the room. Absolutely incredible. And then with visual arts, this other lady has done this experiment where she, because again in Parkinson's, the mind is able to understand the spatiality of steps, you know, of, of, of floor steps. So what she had done is she started printing 3D maps or roll out, you know, wallpaper which was placed on the floor. And that helped the Parkinson patient negotiate. He would have frozen, but he just negotiated it. So she now gives it out free, and that's being recorded across the world as an experiment to bring back mobility for Parkinson's patients. You know, I mean, these are examples not just of arts is amazing, but this is what it can do even in the medical term. The third one was um, they did an experiment with a control group of two to four-year-old kids. Um, one in an autistic spectrum and one with a normal spectrum, one with kids in difficult circumstances, so malnourished, uh, economically backward communities, and one with, um, you know, normal kids. And then they looked at the study and looked at how every time you used, again, music or dance or, or um, uh, visual arts, how the left and the br right of the brain lit up in a way that was absolutely impossible in the other controlled groups. And in that lighting up of the brain, when they looked at the study at the end of that 
the the you know the the second year so when the kids were all four years old and then they measured how a kid who had not had access to this kind of visual or music or theater art therapy and those kids who had what the difference in development was it was enormous including the kids with the spectrum uh, problems and punita right now has been working with kids uh, in conflict with with law in uh, what's the place in majnu katila and she will again talk about what a difference of I and mean, you you can share later what a difference that that process has made what in two months or three months etc and the fourth was a byproduct it happened by accident you know some of you or you may you may have heard of this antidepressant drug called diazep diazepam so it happened by accident so they they were tracking this particular person they started tracking who was a depressive and therefore on diazepam and they done a they done a study in this collective group in terms of what was their artistic um uh, 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 sort of facility before somebody could hardly draw stick uh, figures somebody could hardly do whatever in the two years that they did the study this guy who could b barely draw a stick figure was creating work like van gogh so now they've looked at using that and i'm saying give me some i mean we are all very happy to have some to be able to bring about the artistic ability across populations and the counter to that was that when you have this particular medication um, the one of the side effects is that you get addicted the uh, the um, uh, the effect of getting addiction addicted to it is you get ocd so this particular case the study that they presented this guy used to be memorizing telephone books so every month he memorized one telephone book so he didn't sleep he didn't eat he didn't do anything he only memorized the telephone book so what they did was they used visual arts therapy to continue to give him the telephone book but then to convert it into a collage or a painting or a wall hanging or a carpet or a draping or whatever and completely took his ocd to a different level which both calmed him and created an opportunity for his inner voice and again we have to understand that we all know that the arts creates you know uh, uh, intangible benefits i mean at salam balak trust uh, sunit mentioned in fact they showed a film yesterday or uh, day, day before yesterday saturday called gali galia i don't know whether any of you know so that film it stars manoj bajpai it's a it's a stunning film one of his best performances but the lead co-actor too manoj was one of the kids from salam balak trust om and he's not the first kid to have been benefited from our theater program or our visual arts program vicky roy uh, you know one of our young people today travels the world his photographs uh, populate every major museum worldwide and i think he makes more money by giving ted lectures and lecturing at mit and harvard than he necessarily does from photography anymore but that's the kind of avenues and potential and possibility that the arts have similarly in the uk i used to sit again long hair i used to sit on the diversity thing of the arts council of england it's 25 minutes okay i've got three okay so uh, yeah just, uh, so one of the things we you know london had these big riots at some point of time so one of the things we said is that <coughs> why don't you map where the riots had happened uh, to the places where the council that shut down um uh, 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 community centers and art centers and everybody looked at me like i was mad and i was giving them work to do that was of no benefit anyway 3 months later the report came back it was a perfect match in exactly the same places where the riots happened were the places where the community and the art centers had been shut down i mean how how i mean this is not rocket science if you shut down places where young people go to be able to channel their energies what will they do they will go to the streets they will take to the streets and do stuff that's destructive there's no other way arts and infrastructure i'm now i'm rushing through the uh, whatever because i just wanted to talk about two or three quick things arts and infrastructure when we started working in south africa in 2000 and something one of the things that the south african government uh, 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 reached out to navdeep pagh then consul general was to look at how they can bring back value uh, into new town which was um, you know in in johannesburg where all 
everybody had left because there was only crime. So what we said to them was, why don't you just delineate an arts district here? And I said, in three years' time, I'll walk, walk across Mary Fitzgerald Square with my uh, phone in my hand, uh, and I won't get mugged. And I said, the two things that you have to do is ensure great lighting and great policing. Today, that same area in Newtown is a hub of investment. Buildings have come up, residences have opened, restaurants have opened up, galleries have opened up, the old uh, power, power building has been converted into this big fancy uh, convention center, there are museums, there's concerts. This is about real estate. Abu Dhabi understood it. What do you think the museum in Abu Dhabi is all about, or the museum in Bilbao was all about? It's about real estate. It's about creating a facility for real estate. Similarly, education and universities, university towns today, is about real estate. It's not that they're doing charity. We're creating education for everybody. No. It's because they know what the benefit of creating something like this will be. So we need to, we within the arts community and as planners and, and policy makers have to start looking at the fact that where you have heritage across the length and breadth of India, every nook and corner, every village, every small town, where there is heritage, built heritage, you can look at it as being a place where you then use to create jobs, create merchandising places, restaurants, clean up the space, bring about change in so many ways. You know, like say, for example, the Habitat Center itself has done for this part of the world. What, what was there? You had Mandi House, which was the hub of the arts. There was nothing beyond the nothing. Habitat is an, an exact example of that, of how do you create that kind of, and the need to create the infrastructure and what do you do. I remember in that first meeting uh, with the first, um, uh, what's the position? What's your director general? What's your director of the Habitat Center saying, you know, how will we get so many members? And I said, don't worry. You know, make it expensive. You know, say no to half, half the people who write into you. You will have a great uh, 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 place. But you have to create that kind of value. I'm going to end very quickly by just touching on education for a second. For too long have we looked at the arts as a silo and the sciences as completely something else. They sit together. If a scientist is creating a rocket or designing something to go to outer space, he needs, he or she needs a creative bent of mind. Similarly, for somebody in the creative world, if they're trying to create something, they have to have a scientific bent of mind to be able to know how, from the very visual image, you're able to get to your end product. If you go to Gautam Bhatia's exhibition, which is at the Visual Arts Gallery just down the road from here, you will see this as an example where an architect, and you know, Gautam is, is primarily an architect or a writer and so on and so forth, the way that he's created the art and the end product of it brings all of this together. Metallurgy, the science of, of, of heat, uh, the, the creativity of design, all of it comes together and we have to start removing the hawa that we have about math and sciences and everything is only, you know, it's easy to do this part because it's the arts. It's not. And as long as we continue to make that distinction, we in India are going to start losing out on what I said in the beginning, that entire future knowledge-based uh, economy, which it is. Today, the world over, people are looking to India to come in especially in this, this world of design and creative industries, et, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we are not ready in any way, whether it's through uh, uh, governance issues, whether it's compliance, whether it's having companies of that kind of volume, strength, purpose, intent, uh, uh, and sophistication to be able to attract them. So the Disney's of the world, what do they do? They're having to come in and set up shop and failing because they don't understand the culture. And China's got it. And if we're not careful, they're going to give us, a, right now, we are way ahead of the curve, except we don't know that. China is very used to catching up. In every country that we go to today, our first point of discussion with that minister will invariably be, you know, the Chinese want to come in and do what you've started doing. The Chinese want to invest 
in education. And I'm going to end with Lord Macaulay's very famous statement to the House of Lords when he went back um, in the uh, early, late 17th century, early 18th century. He goes back, 19th century, he goes back, no, the first wala, meaning pre Mughal. Oh. So he goes back uh, uh, to the House of Lords and he says, I've traveled the length and breadth of India and haven't seen any poverty. But if you think that we can conquer India in the way that we've done Africa, forget it. India's diversity and culture is way superior to anything that we've ever seen. And the only way to break their back is to be able to show that our culture and education is superior to theirs. And that then became the first thing of uh, the first steps for the Cambridge mission to enter India. And in leaving you with this, again, my plea and my plea, you know, whether it's at CII or FICI or across parliaments across the world is this, that if we take the arts as to be just that, the basket pay case, the charity case, we're losing out on an enormous opportunity. India belongs to the young. Our time has long passed. If we fail the young, we will fail the very mission of the new narrative of India. And the only way that we can succeed is by creating abundant platforms for this incredible energy of creation that our young people have as part of their DNA from cradle to grave, we understand what celebration is. It's part of our being. It's the only country where our classical arts and traditions survive despite government, not because of subsidy. Nowhere else in the world, especially Europe and America, as you know today, the great operas, the great symphonies, the great philharmonic, the great ballet schools are all dying because there's no sense of keeping them alive anymore. And yet in India, every young person or most young people will, in spite of your phone and Facebook and blah, 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 want to go and learn their Carnatic violin or their Kathak or their Bharatanatyam or their Odissi or, or, or their vocal stuff or visual arts or, or tell a story. Our youngest author last year was 13, our oldest was 92, inspired by what they saw at the Jaipur Literature Festival. Next year, our youngest author will be 10. We must, it's our responsibility, each one of us, to ensure that we provide that platform and we are able to give back to our young people or else we would have failed ourselves and the idea of India. Thank you. No, 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 no. Thank you, Sean Joy, because of that absolutely impassioned uh, lecture, which I think all of us enjoyed with rapt attention. Um, questions before uh, before we go any further? Any questions? Yes, please. Oh, that was really fantastic, Sanjoy. Uh, understandably, you didn't mention Bollywood at all. Uh, my question is, in our mission of knowledge and culture, is Bollywood a boon or a bane? <laughs> so, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Or is it... If you look at, I'll give you the example of the US. US runs its economy and its world uh, smart power on the back of Hollywood. Everything that, ho wherever Hollywood goes, McDonald's, um, uh, Coca-Cola, etc., follows because that is American culture. I remember, uh, you know, when, when Trump came in, one of the things that he did was he, he tried to, he told the budget committee that they, would, they should cancel the allocation to the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, which anyway gets only $115 uh, million. So the Senate committee brought four or five of us from across the world to give them, uh, you know, some kind of understanding of why the arts was important. And I, each of us were given 15 minutes or whatever. I said, I only need five. And I went in and I said, you know, senators, America is known for American culture. If you stop the little funding that you're giving, the only culture that you will be known for is your gun culture. Coming back to Bollywood, Bollywood today drives India's uh, image across the world. It's diaspora. It cuts across the diaspora, across 
the malayali and the telugu and the bengali and the gujarati and whatever it cuts across much of middle east it cuts across africa and it is india's driver at the back of bollywood you need to bring in the rest when we set up our festival in vancouver i remember the minister saying to me he said sanjoy i didn't realize that india had any other culture except for bhangra for example bollywood to some extent is able to show you you know diverse culture however hyped it is we have to use it as smart power we don't we do film festivals in whatever sense that we do and every embassy wants shahrukh khan or amir khan to come that's not using the best of bollywood how do you make sure that that becomes your voice in egypt today uh, uh, once the festival started one of the first things that we said is please make sure that the embargo on bollywood films is lifted because you couldn't show a bollywood film in a theater in a in a cinema theater so in doing that we were able to make sure that everybody was able to access it but until unless you have a follow up uh, 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 white paper and a strategy in place to conquer the hearts and minds of these people which we can because it's such an emotive uh, issue but not just a kind of what we when i say bollywood i mean i mean indian cinema in its you know widest spectrum northeast to malayalam to gujarati to marathi and if you see the awards in recent times and i don't i'm i suspect it's it's reflected in in vidyun's curation here at habitat the best films today are in the languages they're not necessarily coming out of bollywood in the way that we understand song and dance bollywood and therein lies the richness and content because the languages that we have yes in the english speaking world we tend to you know look down on it in the hindi speaking world you want to assimilate and only have hindi but the if you look at content as king and that being the prime value leading into the future it's all in the languages the unexplored stories the nuances the histories the geographies the recounting the everything and it's unexplored and unknown so much of our work at the jaipur literature festival at jbm which is the bookmark is now about translation and how do you make that so manoranjan byapari for example i don't know whether you guys read about this guy i'm sorry i'm rambling on but uh, manoranjan byapari was a uh, at the age of 11 he murdered his first person somebody who tried to sexually abuse him after that he became a naxalite and murdered many people lands up in jail uh, there's a plot to kill him because that was the nature of the of the beast i think it was done by one of my uncles who was then ig of police in bengal but he survives that gets a rickshaw when he comes out of jail in jail he learns to start writing uh, using a stick and looking at the uh, notices uh, on dust reads 200 books comes out pulling the rickshaw a lady gets on uh, she has a conversation with him he asks her a very difficult word she says how did you i mean where did you get this word from so he says you know i'm reading mahashweta devi's book so he said you're reading mahashweta devi's book really so he said yes you know it's just so fascinating and i love so anyway they reach the destination and she gets off and she says well i am mahashweta devi and i'm very happy i'm very happy to help you write your first story so she helps write that first story you know lots of stuff happens he then comes to jlf we were able to introduce him to the world uh, last week he signed a multi crore contract for 17 editions of his work that's where the content lies i mean i know i've given a slightly roundabout but i hope you <laughs> Bollywood to a jailbird who's turned into a major author. Yeah, yeah. I have a few points. Uh, you know, Indian diversity, India's diversity, is also a huge weakness. You talked only about the strength because you know we don't cooperate, and that is why you know uh, things don't develop because uh, there's always so much conflict amongst people. Uh, you have uh, pointed out how to use diversity as our strength but i suppose it's not a difficult thing to do uh, and uh, you know like uh, you take tourism for instance per capita i think india has the lowest tourism in the world 
and we talk about our cultural richness. So what is the reason for that? And as far as the Chinese studying Indian culture, it's interesting to note that, you know, we win the lowest number of Olympic medals per capita in the world. And the Chinese came and studied our sporting infrastructure just to find out how we got it so wrong. This is just part of the thing. So one other thing I wanted to say was that, uh, you know, we're just talking about <coughs> Pakistani cereals and what high quality they are versus cereals on regular Hindi TV. And also why Z stopped uh, showing Pakistani cereals. Was it a case of dissent or commercial loss or what was it? So I'll start with your last question first. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not from Z, so I have no, you know, apart from them being a sponsor, I have no idea, but I can guess why they stopped. It wasn't commercial because their channel was doing very well. I suspect it was their owner's own um, uh, a philosophy that, but that's hearsay. It's, it's not fact, and I'd like to qualify that, and I'm not holding a... You know, the issue of diversity and its, and what you pointed out, those are issues of governance as opposed to um, cultural differences. As long as cultural differences are allowed to coexist, and you know, Hinduism as we know, and I'm using Hinduism in the broadest sense as opposed to Hindutva, the Hindu philosophy in its broadest sense encompasses everything. There, we have no concept of, 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 uh, uh, of, of evil in that sense, and we have no hell, we have no jannum. Uh, we have karma, so anything that you do will come back to you, etc. And our moral philosophy or the Hindu moral philosophy is really a slippery slope because everything is acceptable and our gods did everything to each other and slept with whoever they wanted and blah, blah, blah. And all our temples are very much, you know, witness to some of that philosophy. Where the problem is, is that if we use that in the way, you know, the famous Parsi thing of them coming and going to the king and him saying, you know, you will only sweeten our... Our, our, our milk, etc. If you're able to work in harmony, as we have by and large, yes, there have been periods where you've had, you know, great, you know, whether, whether earlier it was Hindus and Jains, Hindus and Buddhists, Hindus and Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims. I mean, through, uh, through, the, through the ages, there have been particular periods, and much of it has been, as we know, has been about real estate. I mean, the Crusades, for example, is really about real estate. You've used religion to bring people together, but it's a real estate issue. I want to conquer. I want to go here. I want to go there. I want you know, the temple here, and I want the temple there. But Indians per se, and I suspect we will see a resurgence of this sooner or later, you will see the coming back together. What has failed us is governance. We have no, I mean, because we are so ingrained in the kinship where you've had good kings or good rulers or, you know, the Babjis of the world have, you know, done good for their people in a sense, etc. Our politicians don't necessarily come from a united philosophy of doing good. If they did, then in parliament you would see much more debate about legislation and good governance as opposed to, you know, knee-jerk legislation that we see most of the time, or legislation being put through without any kind of discussion or argument. While we are the argumentative people, we tend to reserve that for Republic TV and Times Now, and certainly not for the Houses of Parliament. So I don't see it as a negative. Diversity can never be a negative. You have to find the steeples that will hold diversity together in some sense, and you know, places when you come to our India Habitat Center, which becomes an area for all kinds of people to come together, these are people that, these are places that can create the cement and create the bedrock of understanding for differing and different cultures, both Indian and international, to some plug for Habitat. Excellent. Um, one more question. I'll just see if there are any others, and then I'll come back to you, because you already had one go. Is there any other question from any other part of the house? No, then let's have the mic there. Last question? Last 10, 15 years, populism and autocracy is spreading across the world. Russia, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Philippines, now USA, even India, at the cost of diversity, 
inclusiveness, dissent, and things like that. How dangerous and damaging it is to the arts, in our context particularly. I read today, uh, I, I, I read today that somebody who shouted something against a person of another party was arrested because she said something on a flight. We have seen in recent times uh, the jailing or the killing of journalists. We've seen the jailing of journalists yesterday uh, in Myanmar. We've seen threats in the USA, Turkey, of course, I think 17,000 people are still in jail, China, et cetera, et cetera. It's an enormous issue. And um, I keep saying that it is each one of our responsibilities to speak up. Being silent is being complicit. And if we look at the strength of countries like India, and I really the strength of India is in its diversity, and you try and make it monochromatic, you will kill the very fundamentals that our founding fathers have created. And you know that document 71 years ago, or 70 whatever years ago, is one of the most monumental documents that have been created in this century. And many new democracies have looked at that, bettered it. But the principles that they set in, and the principles created by the bureaucracy in reflection of that document, like universal uh, uh, suffrage, for example, those are unheard of. I mean, at that point of time when women and Dalits and everybody, because it, it, the Constitutant, Constitutant, Constitutant Assembly itself was debating about whether they should give the vote to every, whether it was everybody was capable of being able to cast the vote. And yet the bureaucrats, and if you read Ornit's book, you'll see, just went ahead and said, no, one, Nehru said one vote, one person, everybody must get one vote or one to one person. In America, it came to pass only in 1967. In Australia, till 1987, the aborigine was uh, termed as flora and fauna. Till 1965, you could shoot an aborigine, and you got $500, less than you got, I mean, uh, less than you got if you shoot, no, more than you got if you shot a, 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 a kangaroo. Here in India, I think sometimes we forget in this, in the chaos of democracy, democracy is a messy business. You'll not necessarily always get the result that you wish for, or A group of people, or B group of people wish for. And because it's a me messy business, like when Mrs. Gandhi <coughs> declared emergency and trains began running on time and traffic police people became empowered, we all want order. But what we forget is that order is part of governance, but the world over, because people like you and me have chosen only to speak in hallowed chambers which are air conditioned like this, with beautifully appointed chairs, we have ceded space for those who shout and scream from the street corner. I mean, today's version of Hindutva, for example, I'm a Hindu, you, you know, I'm a Brahmin, but is this our version of it's certainly not. I remember one of our kids during the uh, 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 Godra riots, no, during the Gujarat riots, our younger son, I don't remember how old he was, he came to Punita and me and said, uh, so Papa, wh who are we, what's our religion? So I said, you know, you choose. So he said, I said, why are you asking? He said, no, you know, one lot is killing the other lot, so what's our religion? Are we the people who are going to be killed? You know, and why? Because we, we don't speak up. We don't understand how important it is to be able to speak up. And because the arts can give you a platform and can give you and must give you a platform for all points of view. I mean, when we invited the RSS folks to the Jaipur Literature Festival, half the world went hysterical. How can you give them a platform? And I said, that platform must be open to everybody, every point of view. Yesterday, the New Yorker, half a dozen, uh, 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 authors, a dozen authors have uh, pulled out because they invited Steve Bannon. So now they're looking at rescinding the invite, invitation to Steve Bannon. If you do that, you're only talking to the converted. That is the problem. And when, when we had the RSS people, I mean, uh, Datare and uh, Manmohan Vedya coming in, at least the people were able to understand their point of view. We don't understand anybody's point of view. We, do, we don't have the time. We don't engage. 
they don't engage with us i remember one year tarun vijay when he came uh, and people started booing him after he said something of you know something about muslims and first people kept quiet then he said something leela said got up and waved her umbrella and said you know this is against the constitution blah blah and people started booing him and he looked at me and said i've never been booed so i said you've never spoken to people like this i said you come and speak in your shivir these are people of india that's what they've started realizing and uh, not so long ago a gentleman from the rss came to me very senior head of administration and said sanjoy you must understand the rss is an educational and arts institution and therefore we need to be where you are i mean that's a different story but <laughs> yes that would be refreshing <laughs> any other questions if not i just want to say that uh, this has been really invigorating i think sanjoy and um, i think most of us would agree wholeheartedly with most of what you've said and especially with regard to the importance of the arts in individual personal development as well as its importance in societies in the socio economic concept as well as in development and i think uh, we as a nation have really not capitalized on our tremendous artistic heritage that we have not only heritage but also the efflorescence of the arts that is actually going on around us all the time and we do not somehow comprehend it we don't see it it's happening all around you there are young theater groups uh, there are young people making 5 minute films uploading them on youtube there are people doing all kinds of uh, there are so many young people in the classical arts as you point i'm so glad you pointed that out because the classical arts in india are hardly supported by the government at all or by any other any other industrialist also there is minimal support for it yet there are so many young people engaging with even the classical arts forget about the more popular arts that uh, it's extremely encouraging you look at our publishing industry it has burgeoned in the last uh, 10 15 years the number of writers who have emerged the foreign books are being edged off our shelves by indian books so um, all of this builds not only a civilization and a culture and let me tell you if we pride ourselves as a civilization we are not there is no civilization which can pride itself unless it prides itself for its culture for all the cultural artifacts that it produces all the cultural uh, uh, events that take place all the performing arts that take place those are the basis of all civilization and if we do not value that we don't value anything at all about our so called great culture and civilization we must learn to value it and we have to also capitalize on on it in the international context as sanjoy has pointed out he is fortunately driving a single handed along with his uh, teammates the battle to sort of take our arts abroad and to make our presence felt i do hope there are many more people like you who join you in this march because that way we can convince our policy makers governance being the key as you said that this is an equally important aspect of our social life of our economic life that we need to look at and we must concentrate on it and we must look to creating more and more avenues for our people to express themselves and to bring themselves forward the efflorescence will continue it will happen it will multiply manifold if we just create the spaces and enabling environments that is all that is required as you very rightly pointed out the india habitat center is one such place when it was first set up could we have imagined the kind of activities that take place here across the arts from the visual arts to the theater festivals that we host to the film festivals that we host the dance and music that happens here it's enormous and the conversations which are and the conversations which are taking place right now all the time so I uh, thank you very much Sanjoy that was really wonderful and you spoke to us from the heart and to all our hearts thank you very much indeed thank you